Okay, we're on. So, Terry, thanks so much for joining this uh, video cast or pod video. I don't really know what to call it. Uh, and I, I think, you know, when I started <clears throat> trying to conceptualize what I was getting at, I wanted to talk to people who had a clear, obvious perspective on what they thought AI is. And you're, you're particularly unique <clears throat> and I think special in this context because you have been consistent since, <clears throat> well, if I go back to like, there's a great book that uh, you have a chapter in, and I think uh, 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 Jim Anderson had edited in 1980 talking, called talking, yes. Associative, <clears throat> what was it? Associative, or parallel, parallel, uh, oh, oh, parallel was, models was, of associative memory or something. Yeah, that was a, and, a, a, that, actually, it's interesting you brought that up because that was where I met Jeff Hinton. Yes. I, I was I, uh, meeting here in San Diego in 1979, and it brought together, uh, you know, people like Teovo Cajonan, uh, Stu Geeman was there, uh, it, it, you know, and... It, it, but it, not it Steve Grossberg yet. Uh, Steve, I don't think was there. Was no, there, okay. <laughs> you know, it, was, it, was, it was Dave Romahart, obviously, and Jay McClellan, but... Yeah. No, it, 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 what it was, these were all isolated people that were working in you know, interested in the same area, but, you know, haven't really mu had much contact, you know, because there was no, there's no uh, organization or community, right? It was all a bunch of isolated people working on their own. And probably not well appreciated by talking about neural networks or neur neural well, modeling. Well, well, we were, we, we were the, 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 the uh, outliers yeah. In, every, yeah. in every field, right? Yeah. We were the outliers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. In that context, I, when I went back, there, I saw that. Okay. So you had a chapter called "Skeleton Filters in the Brain." I think that was the name of it. Perhaps not the best title in the world, but still, best. <laughs> "Skeleton Filters" is a little scary. I gotta say. Uh, but 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 it was it was a really. Uh, uh, incredibly easy read and I just I just read it the other day again <clears throat> and in it you you're really you're really going in a subtle way from kind of biophysics you know modeling a neuron and uh, referencing everybody you know Cowan and all everybody who had <laughs> developed a differential equation or anything and um, so this kind of category of modeling you might associate with biophysics or let's just say neural modeling and that neurons and circuits matter and that's what we're modeling for that purpose right that's the purpose of it <clears throat> and so I think you mentioned uh, you know uh, uh, hold on one second I think it's uh, right heartline and ratliff and the limulus crab retina and this is another thing where this provided an enormous amount of data well into the 60s where people were actually modeling and there were predictions and it was very tightly tied to the crab, right? To the crab. By the way, Limulus is an is, uh, eight, has eight legs, it's an arachnid. It's, oh, okay, that's even, <laughs> not, not a fun thing to bring in the lab then. <laughs> but but, but, but it, it, it was, in neuroscience, it was uh, a very special because uh, Hartline and Ratliff, who were Rockefeller, were able to record from single fibers and yep. they could distinguish, you know, what the features were that the, the crab was seeing. Right, uh, right. And, and that definitely, uh, by the way, uh, was a prelude to the same experiment that was done in the mammalian retina by Steve Kupler. Ah, the, cool. Yeah, retina, single, single ganglion cell vertebrae. Okay, so that that brings up like the first category that I think we want to like just put aside here on the shelf for a minute this kind of biophysical neuromology. But then there's this stuff that you often and other people call brain inspired computing. And <clears throat> obviously this picks up on a lot of this stuff in neuroinformation processing, NIPS or NeurIPS, whatever we call it now. Uh, and it picks up on the idea that there are tasks, there are things, you know, object recognition, you know, speech recognition, there's things we want to model in this behavioral way, but the actual reference back to the neural substrate could be thin, 
it could be more of a caricature you know we've got units and connections and stuff but we're not really modeling the synapse or any kind of dendritic structures because you know you know this I don't have to tell you the neuron is a very complicated thing forget networks <laughs> the neuron is just right. a nightmare to model right uh, correctly so and none of that actually gets into this second category very much I mean there's a lot of uh, uh, various kinds of neurotransmitter and, and, and various kinds of noise and, and structure that's there, but not really modeled, let's say, routinely by people at NIPS. Uh, then there's computational neuroscience, which doesn't necessarily, wh which may be some kind of combination of, you know, uh, modeling circuits and, and, and how it relates to behavior. So it, obviously the, the biophysical aspect of that is is also true but but you could just study the circuit just to look at the circuit and not worry about what the function out in the world is so that function starts becoming important for computational uh, neuroscience and then there's a thing that I know Demas Hasebas has talked about in DeepMind which is this and of course it's more of a metaphor it's a reverse engineering the brain the sense in which whatever DeepMind is doing they're taking the biological uh, uh, insights and applying them somehow. Now, uh, uh, many people that I've talked to in this series and, and outside just say, no, that can't be true. <laughs> it's not possible. This is, this is essentially the deep learning, uh, you know, event that we're in is something special it's something very important but it's very hard to relate it back to say uh, neuroscience and and you and i know neuroscientists uh, i can probably find them in the hall here in in our neuroscience center who will tell me no 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 that has nothing to do with the brain uh, but of course, of course there, you know there was like um, uh, de carlo and uh Yamnes uh, uh, and a couple other people who I think in the early days when AlexNet first appeared, they tried to apply this to visual uh, kinds of recording uh, with, with again the mismatch of, you know, they got a couple hundred neurons that they're uh, collecting and then AlexNet has, you know, 10,000 <laughs> units in one layer or something. So, so yes, you could find, you could do the Rorschach testing and kind of find, yeah, it, it, that kind of looks like that. And maybe it's stronger than that. There there clearly there are strong correlations and uh, they did they did fiddle a lot with the data to make that work out, I think. But that, that's sort of where I, I, I'm saying, now, do you think any of that is, is uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, misleading? Okay, so we'll, let me start out uh, uh, with, 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 with the time that's remaining. <laughs> <laughs> no I told you this would go fast. <laughs> Uh, no, the, the, the great, no, you covered a lot of ground there, and uh, I, I want to just start out by s addressing the issue having to do with uh, the relationship between, you know, the artificial networks and biological real world networks, okay? And, and I think there's a real misunderstanding here, okay? Uh, so, what is it that we're trying to, uh, you know, it's, it, there's two two different goals. One is trying to understand the brain, how it works, and the other one is building things that work like the brain, right? And, and, and I have to say, the, the bottom line here is that there's been a great explosion of, for the first time in AI, of the, the of people in the two groups, the engineers on the one hand, and the no biology, and the biologists who know no AI, talking to each other, right? They have something in common to talk about. Now we know whether they are making progress or not. We know we can discuss that, but the but the, I think the real point is that finally the engineers have a vocabulary. We're talking about units. We're talking about weights. We're talking about attention. We're talking about uh, short-term memory, which is something that neuroscientists under you know they, they've been using the same terms, maybe a little bit differently. But the point is that there really is a crosstalk going on, and, and that convergence. Never, never happened in the old, good old-fashioned AI with the symbols and rules and logic, right? That, that, that there was, you know, it, it, the AI guy would say, "Well, where's sy a symbol on the brain? Show me that symbol." And the neuroscientists would look at, you know, with a black face, and he would say, "Well, you know." Well, of course, they're still they're still doing this. I mean, right? The, the explainable AI is simply 
this uh, retread that comes from the 90s back into the present. Yeah, well, you know, it, the, the, you know it's interesting. What is, uh, we, we, can, we can discuss what, what, what the word explainable means. Okay, f I think for them, they want, they, want, they want something that, you know, in English, right? <laughs> they could understand. I think, I think that, that may not be the best way to explain something. But, you know, it, it, but for me, an explanation is mathematical. Right. right. If I right. can understand how something works mathematically, then I think I've understood it a little bit. Okay. So, but to go back to the, the, this point, okay, that's the number one, is that there, that's really where uh, this, this the, di the dialogue now is really where there's a lot of action occurring and a lot of, you know, really advancement occurring back and forth. And, and that's really what, what science is all about. You know. But here's the other uh, point that I want to make, which is that. What we're trying to uh, extract from the brain on a computational level are general principles, right? And and you know there are many. If we could, uh, if we could, we know a few of them, and we've known them for quite a while. It's just that we haven't gotten around to actually exploring them on a, a you know, in, in, in the in, in the, um, a kind of a computational <coughs> uh, discipline. So here are some of the general principles, right? First of all, rather than have a binomial architecture, all of computer science, I shouldn't say all, but you know, 99% of it is built on the binomial architecture, right? All the algorithms that have been explored, and there are some beautiful algorithms, are ones that run efficiently on that architecture. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you know, I use the computers and we use them every day, so obviously very successful. But the real problem with computation at this at the scale that you need in order to be able to solve real world problems, you have to, you have to scale up to you know massive amounts of computation. You know, we don't even know how much computation the brain is capable of, but we know that it's far beyond any single computer on, on the face of the earth. Far, far beyond. And so, how, so we need to find algorithms that scale up. And none of the traditional AI algorithms built for the von Neumann architecture scale up, right? Combinatoric explosions. That's what happens when you have a search. When you're going through it, you know, even when you uh, try to do it cleverly. However, the beauty of nature is nature have, has explored a whole new class of computational architectures, which is based on massively parallel architectures with very high degree of connectivity. So that's that's another space, that part of computational space, right? And until recently, we haven't been able to explore it because computers have been passive, digital computers, right? So we're now using digital computers to explore that space. And I, th and I think the other thing that was missing from AI, which we, we now can appreciate was, was incredibly important, was learning. Now, I know that there are people, you know, doing simple processing learning, but I'm talking about learning through, through data and experience, right? And, and that is, the core of biology. Biology really <laughs> takes advantage of the fact that the, the brain is adaptive, it's able to uh, uh, change, <laughs> literally, the hardware changes. It's not the, the software that you change. <laughs> the, the fact that the distinction doesn't make any sense in biology, but the reality is that, you know, we have a, 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 a system, you know, a physical system here, which can change behavior on the basis of experience out in the world. And look at what happens to a baby in development. It's unbelievable how much synaptogenesis is going on in, in, the, in the brain which is going to adapt the baby to the environment it happens to be in, right? The language it's going to be in, the culture it's going to be in, and, and the world that it's, it's going to grow up in, right, over, over the, the lifetime. So, so it said that that's another Learning is a very, very fundamental principle in nature, and, and, and that was missing. So, so, so let me just uh, interject something there. So, so some of the critics that we, you know, know, like, I don't know, uh, I can, I'll bring up some names later, but it, Tommy Pojo comes to mind as somebody who I, you know, think highly of, but I think he's wrong, but nonetheless, he's, he says, well, these things are really interesting, but they really can't learn like babies uh, because they're really learning on labeled data. They're learning on millions and millions of examples of labeled data, and somebody's going to label these, or they have to be labeled somehow uh, in some automated process. Also, 
uh, the the standard thing that really comes from the 1980s is you have one trial running. You know, the you know, babies start speaking after hearing one word. And of course, they don't. But there's that sense in which people will say that, and uh, I I can I can provide counterexamples of that. But it I what amazes me is I read something the other day that said <laughs> the reason deep learning is on you know the verge of failing is because it can't do one trial learning. Okay, okay, so, uh, well, first of all, okay, <laughs> I, I know that there are a lot of people who've made their careers on this, and I won't mention Gary Marcus on the name. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> <laughs> this is a, this is a no uh, Gary uh, Marcus zone right here, I'm sorry. <laughs> to find fault, you know, with something, but, you know, it's interesting, these people generally are not the ones who are trying to fix it, <laughs> yeah. they're trying to, trying to make an advance. Uh, actually, Tommy is an exception, he, he, he does yes. put a lot of effort into it, yes. so uh, I, I think that, that they're important issues, but uh, but one thing you have to keep in mind <clears throat> is that we're, we're at the very beginning. We're at the right growth stage here, right? We just got off the ground. That's a good so point. Not, That's you know, a great we're point. Not, we're not we're not yet going to go to the moon. I'm sorry, you know, right. it's not going to happen in the next five years. So you know that may be, you know, a asking for too much when you know we're like the baby just beginning to walk. Right? Well, there is GPT three and four and so on. No, These no, 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 those are harbingers. Of, of, of what might what might happen if we continue okay. to, and you know, and like I say, it's all it's being driven by computer power, right? As you know, right. how much computer power? Someone said, like you know, that the, the amount of uh, it was like twenty million dollars for to build GPT three. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Not a lot of people can afford that. But, yeah. but the point is, it, it, it's 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 it's, it's going to happen. Computing, and by the way, to go back to my first point, <laughs> these. Neural network algorithms and, and ones that are, are going to continue to build, um, uh, you know, into the future. They they uh, they are they are they are just they use compute comp parallel computer architectures beautifully efficiently, right? I mean, this is like it's a natural fit. Uh, um, you know, the fact that the supercomputers now are just like a hundred thousand C you know. <laughs> CPUs or GPUs, right? And 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 and, and we, you know, the, the brain has realized that you spread the computation over a lot of processing, but you know, you do that in a distributed way, and you have to have some way. Of, it's got to be a way to integrate that information, and, and those are all the things we're going to be learning from neuroscientists over the next decade, because you know, the brain, is, and that's another issue. But just just to finish the thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first of all, you know. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and you know, supervised learning is just one of many different types of learning. Reinforcement learning, right, is another big win. And, and the whole part of the basal ganglia, part of the brain, is devoted to that. So you know, so deep learning is just the cortex, right? That's just the latest thing, the kind of the supercharged part of the mammalian brain. But you know, before that, you know, animals are going around and we're autonomously surviving, and and they did it with other parts of the brain, right? And the basal ganglia is, is a very primitive part. It's very important for survival. Uh, learning sequences of actions in order to be able to get reward. Now, but there there are other parts of the brain that are equally important that haven't been included yet and, and aren't really uh, like the, the especially the, the the motor system. It, incredibly important if you want autonomy. It, you have to have. I mean, there's a cerebellum, right? There's all of the circuitry that is at different levels, and and and, and everything is built on that. I don't think people appreciate that. The whole all the sensory stuff is there to help the motor system. That's what it evolved for. It didn't. It wasn't a. It didn't evolve for its own sake. It wasn't as if you know, oh yeah, put all this effort and all this resources into the visual system because you really want to be. No, you want your, 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 the reason that you you, you primates have a big visual system is that it helps their motor system solve problems that have to do with you know living in trees and and creating uh, you know to adapt you know the, the fingers that are very uh, flexible and so forth. Uh, for manipulating things, and you know, and, and it, it, that's what's driving things now. But well, so I want to interject. So, so it, it would sound like some kind of deep learning robotics here would be sort of crucial as a, as a research direction. And it seems to me that you know, if you look at Boston Dynamics, and they they don't they they're certainly not using that technology per se. Um, well, that, that's traditional control theory, and it, it's impressive. What oh, so, oh, it's it's shocking, but yeah, it, it, it's it's really good. But I think that you know, like I said, uh, the, the the deep learning uh, cortex 
evolved 200 million years ago in mammals. And before that, you know, reptiles, you know, dinosaurs, you know, they, they had perfectly good motor systems and they, they, they were able to survive and did quite well. You don't need deep learning to have a good motor system. Okay, the cerebellum is actually much more important. And, and like I said, okay, now just the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, uh, you know, the brain is not a one-trick pony. It doesn't have one learning algorithm. Okay, good. Right, right. Okay. And we know that temporal differences also is in the brain. So, you know, there are hundreds, hundreds of learning algorithms that we haven't tapped yet. And they're the ones that babies are. Using. Okay, okay, okay. That's a that's an important point because that's something I was going to ask me to sort of go off on a tangent on was about different kinds of learning algorithms and what's yet to be discovered, in, you know, from looking at the brain. Oh, and, and, and obviously, uh, you know, discovering you know, some kind of uh, 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 credit assignment using error propagation, it, it, you're right, it, it certainly has something to do with uh, mapping and cortical maps, that's great, uh, but obviously we have a lot more functionality available to it, so there must be a lot more learning rules. But then this goes back to this architecture business, because you, you and I remember, we go back to 1980 and we know about black propagation and we know that that architecture and the way in which it could learn uh, turned out to be limited um, but uh, of course it's not just adding more layers it's obviously adding some tweaks that make the error uh, sustain itself longer uh, other other kinds of interesting computational gradient approaches that are that are important in all this that are, you know, really solid technology and optimization, not necessarily understood within neuroscience. So the deep learning explosion, really, in terms of, I heard, so, I, I read some, I, I think it was Josh Tenenbaum, well, you know, they're just doing classification. Okay. Well, <laughs> you know what? Humans basically just do classification. That's what we do all the time. No, no, no. Actually, there's a deeper, yeah. they use that to, the capability that uh, these uh, deep learning networks have. The universal function of proxy is. There's that. There's that. You have, you have no idea how important that is. I'll tell yeah, you, yeah, it's yeah. having a huge impact on science. Yes. Like every area of science. I mean, just look at uh, protein folding. My the protein, fo protein folding is amazing. That's yeah, amazing. That, that was a problem that, that biologists thought would never be solved because the right. computation features look too formidable. And, and you know, and again, you know, it was took a lot of, of the label data. Yeah, okay, it's great because the starting from that is a good thing. But the, the reality is that it, it, it approximated, you know, is able to approximate the physics that goes into folding. And just by, by looking at what the output is, it was able to figure out how it got there, right? Without having to go through every, yeah. you know, femtosecond of folding, right? And so the function approximator is, is that that is now infiltrating every area of biology, every area of physics, every area of science, because of the fact that there are tons of data that are piling up, and, and you can easily use it, for example, and I'll give you one example here at the Salk Institute, right, and, and, and elsewhere, is that you know, chemical microscopes are limited by the fraction limit in physics, which is about half a micron, but uh, the Nobel Prize was given for a simple resolution. And how does that work? What, what you do is you label a protein, and then you uh, image the photons coming in. Now, the diffraction limit gives you a Gaussian. But if you have enough photons, you can estimate the center of the Gaussian to nanometer resolution, right? So you can actually see, and now you can actually track single molecules hmm. with nanometer resolution. And Amazing. And clever somebody who does that. I mean, this is standard practice now. The downside is that these microscopes cost millions of dollars. It takes days to collect enough photons. Right, so you you know not and, and very few people can afford them, and and but, but what you can see with them are so amazing that it's worth investing in it, and there are people who are doing it. Okay, yeah. So here's what someone did, and and we're doing it here at the salt. You take a piece of tissue, you you do the uh, the confocal, and then on the very same piece of tissue, you do the super resolution, you know, which takes a couple of days. You, you that that this is the input to deep learning network. This is the output. And you collect enough data from enough cells, from enough labeled molecules, to train up the convolutional neural network to be able to predict. And it does it with extraordinary accuracy. In other words, hmm. Hmm. with some software, you can turn 
a, you know, a chin confocal microscope into a super resolution microscope. And you can get the answer within minutes. You don't have to wait a day. Right? And this is this is a democratized super resolution. And it's gonna it's gonna revolutionize cell biology because you can now look at the molecular level. You got limited by this. Yeah, and, so and it's just it's a miracle because so what is it doing? It's, it's approximating, it's a function approximator. It's able to approximate the transform of the blurry image with the information hidden in all the noise that looks like noise and, and, and extracts it and transforms it into what the super resolution microscope is doing. So it, 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 it just one out of thousands of examples. And so it's it's not just categorizing. Come on, I mean this is this is really a much more powerful instrument that we have. But I'm not I'm not saying it's the it's it's, it's <laughs> I'm just going off because I think people who really don't know what they're talking about are right to talk. right. Well, that's one reason why I'm bringing this stuff up. So because <laughs> in the context of this conversation, you know, I, I think the other thing about the protein folding thing is so amazing. I, I, I watched some of the videos and and read a paper or two, but. Um, it's it's that there are also some causal principles that they seem to be uh, extracting from this about the biology, but like a lot of deep learning stuff, the what we should call like the post analysis, it's difficult uh, because it is doing something that we may not immediately understand. I mean, function approximation is is a wonderful thing, but it's universal, which means we may not know exactly what it did until later. Okay, okay, now that's where the mathematicians come in. Okay, yes, so I, yes. I was at a meeting a few years ago with, those, with the National Academies organized, uh, and it was, uh, it wasn't organized by, uh, uh, you know, AI people or uh, neuroscientists, it was organized by mathematicians. Yes, yes. And, and it's, it's called the, uh, the Science of Deep Learning. And, you know, it, 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 I mean, these are like fields metal workers. I mean, these are, these are not just you know people who are uh, you know applying mathematics. These are people are creating mathematics. Right, right. And I, the message at the meeting was this: that we don't. It's when you have a paradox that there's a chance that you have to, you can create new mathematics when something is working and it shouldn't according to what you know. Right. Then that there's for some reason, and there's some deep mathematics that is there if you have the right. That's uh, right. Uh, that, tools. That's right. And, and that's really what's going to happen. And, you know, and it's already happening because you know there's just a tremendous amount of interest. I mean, obviously there, there's, and, and, and you know, we, with just a couple of really interesting problems like you know, uh, we, we these are overparameterized, right? And, right. And according to all the, the, the sample complexity theorems, they shouldn't they can't should work. Over, can't work. Over, they can't work, and they, we were told that back in the 80s, yeah. you know, but that stopped us, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> the expert told us it's impossible, you know, you don't listen to the expert. That's right. Uh, we didn't, you know, the other uh, <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing is that, oh my God, non-convex optimization, everybody knows that, that, that stay away from it, right? It's, it's, it's horrible, right? You, you'll get screwed for it because right. you'll get off local minima and so forth. Well, we don't really have them, I mean, you know, it's, it's true, at the very end, you get caught local minimum, but gee, they're pretty good solutions. Right, right. <laughs> and, and, and simple regularizers, so something that I cared a lot about uh, back then, it, it basically yeah. worked amazingly well. And then, yeah. you know, actually there was a thing, uh, I think it was in the second NIPS, uh, John Moody had introduced a kind of a Hessian analysis of all the weights, and he showed that you know, crap, some of the weights aren't doing anything. <laughs> they just sit there. <laughs> and, there, and there's some kind of natural regularization. And of course, there's been theses written on this and people are still trying, why, why in these high dimensional spaces does the system just say, I'm just gonna use the data I need right now and wait for more data. <laughs> I mean, this is a very interesting phenomenon about the layers, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and there's so much to be extracted there and, and it's happening, people are already right. doing and, and uh, by the way, what, I have a paper that came out of that meeting. It was a, it was a, actually a whole special issue. And, and, and each, on each one of these questions, there were you know, Peter Bartlett had a great uh, insight into this orbital parameterization problem, and then you know, non campus But the, uh, the, the point I was trying to make in, in the, my paper was, was that we, for the first time, can explore high dimensional algorithms, right. high dimensional spaces. Right. And it's completely different. Geometry of high dimensional spaces is completely different from our intuition about low dimensional spaces, which is, you know, 
And almost all statistics is based on various uh, parameters, right? And make a lot of assumptions. This is this is a very critical point. It, 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 as I'm sometimes confused as for a statistician, uh, is that st statisticians will say if you come to them with your problem, say, "Well, just get rid of all those other variables. You need to get this as low dimensional as possible, <laughs> so it's linear." Damn it! That's what we we need a linear low dimensional. And of course. Most of statistics, which you know, where uh, the central limit theorem will actually apply properly, have you know small number of random variables that you're summing over, and it will be Gaussian. But by the way, nothing's Gaussian, and nothing's linear for God's sake. Everything is nonlinear and non-Gaussian. Yeah. By, by the way, in the brain, that what's remarkable is that things are uh, log Gaussian. That is to say, there are these long tails. Oh, right, right, right. There's a, right. Yeah, I, I remember Buzaki saying something about this. Yeah, yeah. Buzaki's written a book on this. And, yeah. and, and, and it, it's a reflection of these long tails and the synaptic weights, for example. Right. It's those long weights out on the tail that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Right, right. So, so, so you, know, so you get rare like, event effects, basically, from that. Yeah, from the, the, the yeah, tail, yeah, so, tail distribution. So, so the... the uh, so, the, <laughs> so here's the upshot, okay? And, and I think this is really what, what's going on here. See, the thing is that you start from different random places and then you end up with a different network, right? It's not like one network. You're not looking for one network that solves the problem, which is what statisticians are looking for with convex. That's right. That's right. Best set of parameters and they don't get you know, just one of them. And that's like finding a needle in a haystack. That's and, right. You know, that's right. But now, okay, if, if, you, if there's a if semi infinite number of possible networks, especially when you get the trillion weights, right, then it's, it's a problem that's been transformed to finding a needle in a haystack of needles. Right. Right. This right. is. Words, it, it's, it's a completely different problem. This is this, uh, this lottery hypothesis kind of argument that uh, I forget the, the kids who made this, but, it, but it's the idea that, you know, there's a equivalence class of solutions and one of them is going to get picked out as in a lottery and then you can skeleton, skeletonize the entire network down to that particular solution and it still works once you've removed, you know, 75% of the original parameters. And so this, th there's another, uh, there's a book that's coming out by again two sorry to call them kids but I'm getting so old I can't think of anybody who's not a kid anymore <laughs> uh, uh, two guys at Facebook uh, and I think that Roberts and Yada and they they pushed this thing on the archive a month or two ago called principles of deep learning it's a 500 page book that oh, I, I, I saw that yeah is mostly okay. math and I've talked to them a bit and my goodness, this, I mean, it's like they took a, a beer truck and smashed in through the wall. <laughs> and they just put all this physics in it, and they're looking at it. And I, I was very impressed with, I mean, they seem both naive and very impressive. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> how to put it otherwise. You know, no, this, this is a, a, a kind of a indication of how much energy is going into this right now. Right. I mean, this, that must have taken 500 pages. Come on, you know, that, that's, yeah. that's a, you, you, you know, you've written a book, haven't you? Yeah, well, yes, <laughs> at least one. Well, you know what that means, right? Yes. It's like, it's like a huge in, 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 uh, investment of your time and effort. Yeah. But it's happening all over the world. Uh, you know, mathematicians all over, and, and you know, they're, they're really bright, and, and they're making real progress. And this is this is really where the future of explainability is going to come from. So I'm, I'm really excited. About now, was that was that math script? There was a there was a deep learning math script that all of a sudden appeared in Princeton at the Institute of Advanced Studies, and there was a, a person who's an Italian mathematician. I'm sorry, I don't remember his name, but Aurora. they. What's that? I think his name is Aurora. Yeah, it could be. And, and, he, and he had a group, and he had a couple workshops. I attended a couple of them. And um, the people who were giving plenary talks were singularly unimpressive. But all the young people <laughs> were amazing. And the posters, I walked by the posters. I said, what the hell are you doing here? I was like, I was shocked at every, every place I went. It's just one of those kind of uh, initial, you know, uh, signs that, you know, the weather's changing, folks. Yeah. And okay, so Steve, you just put your finger on what I think we need, and what is what's happening right now, which is that 
you know, the, 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 the city of people who have made their career, and I won't mention names like Michael Jordan. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, you know, on, on an area that was, you know, at the time, really exciting and everything, and and you know, feel that things have sort of passed them by. It, it, it's 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 really because it's the younger people jumping in who have the new ideas and they have the energy, they have the enthusiasm, and and, and it's percolating up. We see this. I see this here. My students are, you know, so much farther ahead than I was at their age in terms of sophistication and the computational facilities that they have and so forth. Yeah. And they're not going to stop. They're, they're, they're just going to barrel ahead. You know, they're not, and, you know, what Max Planck once said, you know, it's not old ideas that die, it's the people who believe in them. <laughs> well, this is right. I mean, I, I, I had started writing something, uh, uh, sort of a historical exegesis on all this, and, and I got this great book, uh, the Macy Conference. I don't know if you, you probably have it too. It's a oh cy cybernet. It's, it's essentially from University of Chicago, and it covers all the transactions between, you know, von Neumann and Wiener and Shannon and you know just about everybody who was anybody in computation now they had a whole bunch of psychiatrists and they had uh, they had Margaret Mead and her See, awful I, husband Bateson <laughs> you know him. It was, it was cybernetics it was yeah it was, it was a cybernetics it's it's the yeah. transactions on all the cybernetics yeah but but it was uh Warren McCulloch who actually organized it. Warren McCulloch was given a grant by Josiah Macy Foundation right. to run nine years of this thing. Okay, okay, so, okay, number one, okay, when I was a graduate student, and I should have been studying my general exam, I read all of those. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a transcription of what they said. It was yeah, like, yeah, 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 so, so yeah, I, I, I got that a couple years ago. I, I, I just the breath of, I just bought there's a book you can buy now, a compilation of all the comics. I think there are like six. Five six. Yes. Oh yeah. No, no. There, no. There's a book. There's a book you can get that has all nine years yeah, yeah, in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just been cruising through it, and I reminded, I reminded a lot of things there, kind of in the back of my mind. You know that, that they had a lot of really great ideas. They, they, they did, and a lot of it is familiar to what we're, you know, kind of going through now. They, they didn't really have. Um, a computational substrate, but they had a lot of theory. I mean, McCulloch and Pitts, of course, sort of set the stage for, you know, propositional logic being in the brain, but then then there was just all this other stuff. Now, what interesting, when I was reading more about it, there were so many psychiatrists there, and they were all pushing it. One of them actually got connected with the CIA, and he was the guy who pushed MK Ultra. Out of the and and the Macy Foundation funded that stuff out of this kind of stuff. The other thing was an endocrinologist who uh, was he attended I think the third and the fourth meeting, and he was talking about reproductive. And then at this point they were all racists and eugenicists anyway. And 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 they said, well, is there anything you could do here? You know about reproductive uh, control? He says, yeah, probably. And so he invented the pill. And so the Macy Foundation funded. <laughs> Despite the fact they sort of changed the entire artificial intelligence, you know, kind of uh, land uh, landmarks, they they basically then funded MK Ultra and the pill. And so th this is and 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 Josiah Macy was just this awful character, but he believed in science and the whole idea after World War II was we we're going to like cross sciences and that's why we bring all these people together. The, my last comment, the second thing that happened from this is the computer scientists and mathematicians who were there, they hated the psychiatrists and anthropologists so much, they organized a meeting with a little assistant professor up at Dartmouth named John McCarthy, and it was, that was the sort of backlash from the Macy meeting was the AI conference. It, it wouldn't have happened, except these guys said, we don't want any psychiatrists here, we just want to. Let's oh, okay. study computation. No, it, 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 is, it is wonderful uh, to go back and, and see historical roots. To yeah. Where you yeah. Can. And, and a lot of it is not known. You right. Know, just a lot of the things that you just said, I'll bet there's 99% of people out there have never heard of who was up in DC. No. Never heard no, of no, they haven't. No. History. And I, I learned this because I took history of science uh, classes when I was a graduate student. And what basically, when you go back and, and, and dig and find out what's actually what's happening, it turns out to be that things were completely chaotic 
Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's Nobody right. really knew where things were going, and people were interacting. They were had ideas and did things. It's only later that you know they, it gets filtered out. That you go back and you say, "Oh, look, there's this one person here," you know. And but the fact is that one person was connected with ten others and ten others, and and you know it came out of some kind of community effort. It, it was one of the, th the things in history of science is it's, is is to go from the great man idea that they're oh. Isaac Newton had all the ideas, and we're just following. And we're just following it, right? No, no. History. No, it turns out that you know, they were all part of a community at the time, and you know they interacted yeah. with each other, and they, and they they fought with each other. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's, and that's what, what what's going on right now, right? We have this we have this whole milieu uh, of people coming in from all the areas, and you know now it's it's. it's it's involving society and you know all of the ethical things and my god you know yeah. this is all mushroom you know, yeah, like yeah, the yeah. well well of course the advantage as we were talking about the younger people have over uh, that kind of historical exegesis where you go back is they're like worried about solving this problem <laughs> they don't really want to know who McCulloch was and they don't really care they're <laughs> just doing it you know it's sort of like it's sort of like you say so we're going to make some risotto tonight and then it, you know people start debating about it and someone goes to the kitchen and just does it they make it <laughs> <That's like> the <laughs> yeah 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 you no, know, it, 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 you're absolutely right. It, it's, uh, it's, it's what's, what's important is not to argue about the philosophy or who did what. It's actually make a contribution, make something work, get something that goes. You know, and, and but the, the, the and there's also another good reason why it, it's impossible to actually be able to reconstruct the past, and which is that uh, it's too complicated. And number two. Uh, what you have to pass up in a textbook is basically a thumbnail sketch of yeah. what came, what, what emerged, and you have to attach a name to it because human beings need a story. Right, right? it's right. a narrative. You have to have the narrative, you have have and, narrative. You, and it has to be you know pigeonholed so people can go, oh yeah, that's the thing. And, and it's just by you know it, 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 you know and people sort of attribute everything to, to that one person, like you know they did it all. But it's really that it was a, it came out of the community, and and they may have made a little bit better contribution, but the fact is that. <laughs> the textbook is, is only giving you not even a thumbnail skin, it's just kind of a, a couple bits of information. Right. About right. So I, so I, I have a, so I, you know, I have kind of an architecture question, but I want to go back. I, I, and the architecture question goes, you know, the, you, we've got ZFNet and AlexNet and, of course, the Lynette and all the, all the, 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 the name net. And the architecture is all very a bit, but the principles under which these folks are constructing the architecture seem to me still uh, a, a little bit, uh, you know, after the fact. I mean, it's a little, little bit seat of the pants. I'm going, well, we, we probably need something more narrow than broad. <laughs> we probably need something long. <laughs> yeah, so there's a sense in which there's not a principle there, there, there's no let's call it a handbook of architectures if there was such a thing written as called the handbook of deep learning architectures what would that actually be what, i mean there's it would have to be some hierarchy here wouldn't there be in this thing so, so you know it's funny you bring this up because I, I'm, I'm just about to uh, uh, revising a paper that i think is going to really uh, illuminate that question okay oh cool so right now... Can you send it to me? <laughs> I'll, I'm sure I'll be happy to. Okay, great. Uh, actually, I think there's an, uh, an earlier archive version. Uh, oh. I'll send you the, uh, the vision. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the traditional view of, of a deep learning network is that, well, you fix the, the, connect, the architecture, as you say, layers and numbers of units and so forth, all the hyperparameters. And then you just, you know, feed all the data in and train it up, and then at the end you have a network which is fixed and does whatever it's supposed to do, right? Like, you know, one one application per architecture, you know. <clears throat> so uh, I've been collaborating with uh, Hava Siegelman. Oh yeah, I know Hava. And sure. with Kate Tai, who's who works on neural modulation here at the Salt Institute. Ah. And we have uncovered something which is really interesting. So hmm. here's, 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 the, here's, here's, the, here's the motivation. So if you look into real brains, in fact, you don't have to look into a brain, just look at the, the stomatic gastric ganglion, the lobster, right? The thing that runs the stomach, right? 
the very same network can be used, but neuro, neuromodulatory uh, inputs, chemical inputs that are like scalars, can shift the very same network to do different things, different kind of rhythms, different kinds of oh, outputs, different oh. functions, the same connectivity, but with, by changing either the strengths of the weights or the, the excitability or any number of physiological parameters, you, you, can, you can make the, the same network do more than one thing. So it taps, it taps different dynamics. You get, you get. Yeah, but, but, but with different dynamics. Like for example, somatic gastric ganglion. There's something called a gastric mill and a pyloric mill that, uh, that, that they're, they're like chewing up the food. Right. But they have different uh, time uh, uh, periods. One is one second and one is ten seconds. You know, for, with different functions at different points. Well, at the beginning, you want to claw it up and so forth, and the other things you shove it down the, the gastric tract. But the but the point though is that. Neuromodulators are all over the brain. There's like dozens of neuromodulators. These neuromodulatory systems are really, I know to be very important for cognitive function, right? All psychiatric drugs are acting on these neuromodulatory systems. Dopamine, serotonin, right? And, and it goes on and on. So, um, so what we did was we said, okay, can we tr train a recurrent neural network to do two different things? One with the neuromodulator, one without. And we pick something simple. With the neuromodulator, you decrease, you increase the strength of all the synapses by 50%. And what we discovered is that, yes, you can actually train the network to put out two different outputs for the same input. Hmm. In fact, opposite outputs, right? Hmm. And then we said, okay, well, that's interesting. It means the same, just by changing a scalar uh, for, for you know, one parameter, uh, it, you, can, you, can, you can embed two different functions in the same network and then we couldn't do more so we got up to 200 units we got to nine <laughs> and, and you don't have to, to change all the ways you can just change 10 percent of them for each output that you are so they're not orthogonal functions but they're functions that somehow create a mosaic across the function space so that they can coexist right. and be tapped by the neuromodulatory kinds of effects yeah, exactly. By by varying where, what's what subset is being neuromodulated, you vary the output for the same input, and and, and you can make it do almost anything. Okay, I mean, and, and so we analyzed it. So it turns out that there's mathematical tools now. So you analyze the trajectory of the network in this high-dimensional space, yeah. activity space, and it turns out what's happening is that for a given, once you get up to like nine, what, what's happening is that. <laughs> There's like a tube of activity for a given input. For you actually, you know, you can have several inputs for one function, obviously. But the idea, though, that you, the very same inputs can be now switched over with a, a different part of the network to another uh, output, <coughs> different output, and and it's like a tube. The trajectory is like a hypertube through this activity hey. space. Again, high dimensional space. And what's happening is the neuromodulator is allows you to move the hypertubes around. Wow. So it's, that's it's a way of redirecting, you know, the activity through these different pathways. Interesting. And interestingly, there's experimental evidence for this, and this is uh, something David Tang did recently. Huh. Uh, beautiful paper in Nature, just earlier this year. Oh wow! And he actually showed that that's just what's happening in, in the, I think it was the hippocampus. Huh. So you know, it, it's it's really interesting. That's a, uh, yeah, that 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 sounds terribly exciting. I I'm, 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 I look forward to look at that. But but that, now does that really? Now I see what you're saying, but. You know, if you're a Google engineer sitting trying to, you know, tweak some uh, task a little to get, you know, one tenth of a percent more error out of it, <laughs> you're, you, usually when I've talked to some of these folks, and at least one was my st uh, student of mine, he says, well, we just add more hidden units. You know, it's sort of like the Alan Lapides, you know, you know sprinkle hidden units <laughs> and you get better of it. And it's very best the uh, hidden units. So and that, that uh, sadly, that in at least engineering points of view, that seems to be the prevailing so, kind of strategies, know, right? So, uh, this, this is <laughs> so what, 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 what's going on is that there is an established paradigm and it's being optimized. It's just like every single technology, that, let's look at the steam engine, right? The very first steam engine, James Watt, it blew up. Yeah. You know, you had to invent the regulator, right? Yeah. It, it was very unsafe. And and, 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 and then you needed a theory to, yeah. to optimize. You, yeah. you know, thermodynamics. 
Right. And, and that helps you optimize. So now you have a much more efficient engine and it's safer. And it took 100 years to get to the point where steam engines are pulling, you know, million pound locomotive across the, 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 the continent, right? And, 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 and that, they, they, you go from a proof of principle and you optimize it and you keep improving, 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 and it goes in some direction and you start solving even more difficult problems. And we're just at the very beginning of that process, right? But what we're talking about is, 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 not, is not that process, which is going to continue. But what we're talking about is a, a new architecture, a new uh, set of principles that have to be added. And nature is a wonderful source of them. Because nature, again, has already been there. And is already doing things with a fixed number of, of neurons that makes it much more flexible. And we, and we know... <laughs> We know a lot of the biology. By the way, it's you know it's it's, it's embarrassing how much we know about <laughs> all the details. Uh, you know, we can record from a million neurons at the same time. We have a census. We know how many cortical neurons in in motor cortex just came out in Nature a couple of months ago. There's like a hundred different types of neurons, and, and and you know, and a couple dozen different types of glial cells. Hmm. You know, and, and, and in, the, in the textbook it says, well, there's a pyramidal cell, there's an excitatory neuron, and there's an inhibitory neuron. Right, and that's it. Well, <laughs> it it's telling us that uh, in nature has optimized things, it, it, it given an inductive bias by virtue of the fact that if you start out with very specific types of neurons connected in a specific way, that's inductive bias. And that has evolved over many millions of years. And that is why babies, when they come out of the box, actually are already uh, pretty far along. They don't have to learn everything. Right, but there, but but the, the inductive bias part of that is the way you're describing it, as opposed to, let's say, you know, uh, Chomsky and, and various of his students might describe the language acquisition device. That it's a big plug in the head that boop, comes on. So that but your inductive bias is a lot, you know, more subtle. And it, 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 it somehow reduces the function class you're living in, maybe, uh, that you have to deal with as a baby. Okay, so, the, so the, the, here, uh, the, we're running out of time, but let me just yep. give you a, a big picture. We, we have five minutes. Okay, well, we have enough, just enough time to, uh, to give a, a summary. But they, okay. The title of a PNAS paper, Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences paper, is The uh, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Deep Learning in AI. I read that. I love that paper. Okay, okay. Uh, and, and here, okay, up until recently, computer science has been living in this really, you know, kind of a very uh, uh, focused part of computation space. Very powerful von Neumann architecture, and, and we've exploited that, right? And now we're taking our, first, like, pioneers, works of art. We're going out and we're touching a couple of architectures here in the space of parallel, massively parallel architecture. And we have a few algorithms now, and it looks promising, right? But that space is vast. We haven't explored yet. We're just beginning. And the mathematics, we know, is going to be strange and different from anything that we now know. So this is what we should be thinking about, right? In, in, in terms of the next generation, they're going to be going out there, right? And they're going to be, you know, they're coming back with, you know, wondrous things that they discovered, right? And it's going to amaze us because we're still living here in, you know, Flatland. <laughs> <laughs> this is another one of my favorite books. Maybe one dimension, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's a, there, there actually is a quote here. Hold on. Uh, once regarded as just statistics, deep recurrent networks are high-dimensional dynamical systems through which information flows, much as electric as electrical activity flows through the brain. It's a dynamical system, and it's a very complex. Well, it's, it's a, a it, it's a great yeah. quote. <laughs> you probably recognized it. Right now. Yeah, that, 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 you picked out a really good one. Yeah, that that that's that's one of my favorite quotes in the in in the in the paper. And I see it was like a, a kind of a Sackler talk over, you know, the, 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 you know kind of uh, you're creating a space so people can understand what's going on. And the problem is, is, is what we're seeing is there's just a lot of people looking for spotlights coming in and criticizing and doing, oh, we're just on the verge of another, you know, AI winter. And, and of course, 
um, the, you know, the media has basically taken deep learning and called it AI. I mean, that's that's just the reality of our of our situation. So whatever happens, you know, if Elon Musk develops an algorithm and smashes cars into people, it's our fault for doing deep learning, even though he doesn't use deep learning. So, the, so th this is another lesson, and people don't understand technology. So, it, it, like I said, it took 100 years to perfect the steam engine, and it, it you know, it, it, it's going to take decades to the, get to the point where we have safe and reliable self-driving cars. And you know, people don't understand that that, that all technologies take right. decades. You know, there's nothing special about this technology. It's just you know, because uh, yeah, unintended consequences, things you don't understand, begin to happen, and you know, it takes a while to figure out how to get it to work. Properly. Well, one could say that the the so-called AI winter from 1980s and 90s was really just part of this longer process. It really wasn't an AI winter. It was kind of a pause, and here we are <laughs> with the uh, you know the whole system rebooting itself, but really not that far from where it was. So if you remember back propagation, I mean, in other words, if you came if you came into this right now and said, "What what is this deep learning stuff?" If you didn't know there was back propagation, you would say, "Oh my God, it's all bad." No, it's this continuous thing that is unfolding in front of us. I I I, I think this AI winter stuff is 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 that kind of you know made up narratives to for people can explain things to themselves. So what's driving all this? It's all about scaling, and we brought this up earlier. That's the whole right. name of the game in computation is scaling up if you have algorithms that scale up we didn't know this in the 80s we didn't know that we could solve these problems but right. you know and, and it's right you're right it's the same algorithm same architectures you know but on steroids right? but, but yeah but but different that's it that's what i'm saying it, it does feel like the thing became more of an amoeba and it's covering history in an interesting way that we wouldn't have predicted in you know in 1998 i i wouldn't have guessed this by the way, here, here's here's a little uh, retrospect. Of, remember NetTalk? I do remember NetTalk. <laughs> okay, okay, so what was unusual there was that it was a language application. Yeah. Right? How to read out loud, right? And and how to pronounce letters that are very ambiguous and very right. complex, and with a lot of exceptions. You know, language is very very. And and at the time it was thought, well, that is the highest level of right. cognition, language, right? Yeah. So how how would you possibly get this little network with, you know, literally 200 units of 10,000 10, yeah. ways to, yeah. to, 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 to actually make progress with a problem like that? Yeah. Well, we now know the answer. The answer is neural networks love language. Right. Not too surprising because language right. comes out of a neural network in our brain, right? That was right. there long before language. Right. You know, they was like there's a language organ. It's because the cortex have been used, reused in humans for this task. And of course, it's going to be efficient. On language, that's why GPT-3 is so effective because <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about matching the, the, the computation being done to the architecture. And language is a good match. Yep, yep. I, I had written somewhere in a, a review of somebody's book. I can't remember who it was. It was back then, and I said, "Well, for sure, we know that you're never going to have a machine just use propagation and read the encyclopedia and learn language. That'll never happen." <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I was giving a talk somewhere and I put that quote up and I said, wrong. <laughs> and then you go through the GPTs and you go, well, I don't know what's happening there. I mean, you know, probably these are high dimensional spaces with clusters of phrase structure and they get popped out by similarity, but whatever. Uh, it's still incredible. The beauty is that the very same network does both syntax, semantics, and, yeah. you know, and, and which it should, that, you know. which it should. That's what we do, right? Yeah, yeah. that's what we do. So that's not different. By the way, Ch when you're talking about language, Chomsky, his famous uh, essay, it was in the uh, New York Review of Books, right? The case against B.F. Skinner. Yep, and I know that one. Right? In my book, right, The Deep Learning Revolution, there's a quote, a beautiful quote, and in, in it, he, he, he makes fun of, of learning as being a way to solve something as difficult as language. He, yeah. he says, I cannot imagine being able to uh, learn language, you know, from an impoverished uh, environment, you know, uh, with, with, with learning without using powerful mathematics, right? And, 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 and if you come down to it, okay, there was an argument with philosophers called the argument from ignorance. That's I right. can't imagine it, therefore it's impossible. That's right. That's right. Well, <laughs> 
Dave, 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 Dave Rumahart uh, uh, had a, uh, you might remember, had a phrase he said, proof by lack of imagination. <laughs> 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 you know what? I think we'll, we'll, we'll also end it here. This has been so much fun. I could just go on talking and talking with you. And who knows, if I continue doing this before I'm dead, I'll, I may come back and come over to you some other times if you're available. But this has been uh, fantastic. Thanks again. And uh, I'll see you whenever we can be at NIPS together again. Yeah, I'll be uh, actually next month. But, no, but, but that's, isn't that virtual? It's virtual. It's virtual. Yeah, okay. But we're looking forward to the next in-person meeting, probably 